There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. I'm going to take you to a portion of Scripture in just a moment, and we're going to stay in the same portion of Scripture all day long today. So once we get there, if you'll mark your place, you'll be ahead of everybody that did not come to Sunday school this morning, okay? And uh, in this hour, the morning hour, the evening hour, I hope you'll be here for all of it. And uh, just, just try to get all three sections of this because I'm convinced that the Lord uh, is using it in my life and just really praying God will use it in yours. Uh, let's pray before we open the Bible together. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you this day for your love and mercy to us. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit who is our teacher. And now, Lord, we are conscious, deeply conscious, that without you we can do nothing. And I pray that the Lord will do the work that only the Lord can do in our hearts. And Lord Jesus, fulfill your promise that your Spirit will guide us into all truth. Help us be open and willing and humble and ready and obedient. And I thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to open your Bible with me, if you will, please, in the New Testament to the gospel according to Matthew. And I want to take you to a very familiar portion of Scripture. The problem with familiar portions of Scripture is that they are familiar portions of Scripture. And uh, sometimes people think, oh, I know that already, but I want to try uh, to look at a familiar portion of Scripture with you today and ask that you look at it with fresh eyes. And Matthew chapter 6 is right in the middle of what we commonly refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord's most famous message. And uh, His first message, I was thinking about this this morning, it's fascinating to me. If you have the time to read the whole thing, don't do it while I'm preaching, but on your own time, read the whole Sermon on the Mount again. And the interesting thing about Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is if you had to give one theme to it and say, this is it, this is what the preacher's preaching about, he is basically speaking to his disciples in the presence of lots of other people, but to his disciples about what it means to live in simplicity and sincerity. Now, that's a very interesting thing to me. Remember the Apostle Paul said he wanted to live in simplicity and godly sincerity. So it's like from the very beginning, the Lord Jesus was showing what genuine Christianity is like as opposed to what a religious form and function is like. As a matter of fact, he does a lot of calling out of the Pharisees and the religious people in this particular portion of the Bible. He held his most harsh words, not for the harlots and the tax collectors, but for the Pharisees and the scribes. That'll tell us all something. How many religious people are here this morning? Would you raise your hand, please? Big and high. Come on, don't be ashamed of it because the reality is the Bible says there is such a thing as pure religion. I hope you have pure religion. But the world would say we're religious people. I mean, you got up this morning and you got cleaned up and grabbed a Bible and came to a place of worship and walked in and said, God bless you to somebody. And, you know, from the world's perspective, they would say, well, those are religious people. But I want to tell you something. If all you have is religion, you have fallen far short of what the Lord Jesus Christ came to give us. So when you come to the Sermon on the Mount, he's getting really to the heart of the matter. He's getting down to the way his followers are supposed to live. And then when you come to Matthew chapter 6, he comes, I think, to the deepest part of it. And that is not to the externals, but to the internals. In fact, let me just show you something. We're not going to study all of this, but look at verse 4. Talking about alms, good works, look at verse 4. That thine alms may be, what's the next two words, church? Mm. Would you mark that in your Bible? In secret. And thy father which seeth, what's the next two words? In secret, himself shall reward thee openly. Look at verse 6. But thou when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is what? In secret. Would you mark it in your Bible? And thy father which seeth, here it is a fourth time, in secret, 
shall reward thee openly. Come down to verse 18. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is, say it please, in secret. And thy Father which seeth <laughs> in secret shall reward thee openly. You've got to wonder how many times did the Lord have to say it before we start listening to him. I don't know how it was at your house, at our house growing up. If my mama said it once, we were supposed to listen. And all God's mothers said amen to that. And if she said it twice, we were really supposed to listen. If she had to say it three or four times, it was too late to listen. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Six times in one passage, the Lord says in secret, in secret, in secret, in secret, in secret, in secret. I believe this. The secret to open blessing is the secret life. If you ever see a church that's experiencing blessing, now hear me with your heart just a moment. If you see a church that has the blessing of God on it, it has very little to do with what is taking place just in their public meetings. It is not what goes on on the platform that changes a church. It's what happens in a prayer room somewhere. If you see a family that has the blessing of God on it, it's not because they're spit, shine, and polish and say and do all the right things and have it all together. It's because somewhere in secret, somebody is seeking the blessing of the Lord. And if you see a life that has God's touch on it, I tell you something, it is not because of what those people are in public. It is because of what they are in secret where only God sees. So when you come to Matthew chapter number 6, you're coming to the secret life. The funny thing is, when we even use the word secret today, we usually are referencing something that's evil or bad. But I want you to know God has some divine secrets He wants to open to us. You know, Jesus made all the mysteries known, you see. And so He's opening to us the way of blessing. I want to zero in on the middle one, if I may, and that is the secret life of prayer. So from verse number 5 down through about verse number 15, that's what I want to look at with you through the day today, from verse 5 to verse 15, and look at some of these prayer secrets. Let's start here where the Lord begins. Look at verse number 5. He says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And I love verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. How many of you are glad your Father knows exactly what you need today? So if your Father already knows what you need, why tell him? That's a legitimate question. Did it ever dawn on you that prayer is not getting something, it's getting someone that the greatest answer to prayer is not that you got, got something from God, but instead you got to God. That the greatest privilege of prayer is not that you can say, well, this is what God gave me this week. No. The greatest privilege of prayer, friends, is that you and I, black-hearted, hell-deserving sinners who desperately need the mercy and grace of God every day of our lives, have the privilege and the opportunity of coming into the throne room of the Creator God of the universe. Think of that just a moment. God Almighty, who said light, and there was light, and it was very good, invites, let me use a deep theological term, pipsqueaks like us to come into his presence through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ponder that just a moment, and we're too busy. Too busy to pray. Too distracted to commune with God. So before we get into all the particulars of it, let's just start with one thing today. Would you write this down somewhere? I want you to make a few notes so that you can meditate on this and, and work at the application of it during the week. Let me talk to you in this Bible study hour about the secret place. Do you believe there is such a thing as the secret place? Psalm 90, the psalmist talks about dwelling in the secret place. Psalm 91, abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Several years ago, I was preaching in um, Memphis, Tennessee. 
It was a revival meeting in a church I'd never been in before. Matter of fact, I, I had flown in just in time for the evening service and, and walked through the door. Now, there was a younger pastor pastoring the church by the time that I was there, but the, the older pastor who had pastored that church for, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 years, he was, he was really one of God's men. I mean, he knew the Lord, walked to the Lord. I had never met him before, but I'd heard his name many times. I came to the door. I didn't recognize him, but he was the first person to greet me at the doors. I came into the lobby that night just before church. He shook my hand. He introduced himself, and I said, oh, I know who you are, and we chatted for a moment. And uh, at some point in the conversation, uh, we were talking about the fact that it was a revival meeting, and I said to my new friend, this elderly man, I said, well, we pray that God will give us a real revival. He had been very pleasant to that point, very very kind, very gracious, smiling. His countenance dropped. He got very serious and sober. And he said to me, do you know why we have not had revival yet? And I knew at that moment I was speaking to a man who really walked with God and known the Lord and had a perspective that I, as a really young preacher at that time, did not have, and I said, why is that? And he started to weep. I'll never forget this. Tears filled his eyes, and he said this to me. Oh, I can hear it like it was yesterday. He said, we have lost the meaning of the secret place. I don't think I'll ever forget that old man saying that. We have lost the meaning of the secret place. And you know what? He was exactly right. You see, what we have created, we have created, I'm using the term we very collectively, you know, for for modern-day Christianity, but we have created an American form of Christianity that is a world away from the biblical Christianity that the first century church understood. I mean, we come into beautiful buildings. By the way, you have a beautiful building. This is is marvelous. And there's nothing wrong with having beautiful buildings. Aren't you grateful God's given you a place like this to meet? And aren't you grateful to God for heat on a day like today? And aren't you grateful to God for the liberty we have to assemble together? I'm glad for all of that. But I'm going to tell you something. If we're not careful, we reduce our Christianity to the public displays and to to what men see, and we forget that the engine that drives the whole thing and the power source that moves the church forward is what happens in the secret place. Before we get into this, I want you to mark something in your Bible. In verse 5, I want you to mark the little phrase, when thou prayest. Do you see that word? Do you believe every word of Scripture is given by inspiration of God, church? No, no, nothing there by accident. Every word matters. All right, so when thou prayest. Look at verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest. Do you see it? Look at verse 7. But when you pray. You're noticing a pattern. Notice what he did not say. He did not say, if you pray. He said, when you pray. The Lord literally assumes that if you are a follower of his, if you are a child of God, if you are a sincere seeker, then one of the expressions of that is going to be that you pray. <laughs> and maybe, maybe you're where you need to be on your prayer life. Let me just let me preach to me today and you listen. Is that all right? Because I'm under conviction. Did you know it's easier to preach than to pray? It absolutely is. Some say, oh, I wouldn't want to preach. I mean, I have to stand up there and talk to people. Yeah. But you know what's easier to do? It's easier to stand up and talk to a bunch of people than it is to have the discipline to get alone and seek the face of God alone. Old Dr. Rice used to say that all of our failures are prayer failures. Why would he say such a thing? Prayer is the only thing we're told to do in Scripture without ceasing. Now, if I wrote the Bible, aren't you glad I didn't write the Bible? If I wrote the Bible, I would say, go to church without ceasing and read the Bible without ceasing and witness without ceasing and do right without ceasing. And, man, we could make ourselves quite a list, don't you think? But the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible said, pray without ceasing. wonder why that would be. I'll tell you why. Because your prayer life is your Christian life, and every other area of your walk with God grows and flows out of what you are in the secret place when you pray. And so if that is true, then maybe we need to give a little more attention, not to what we are in front of men, but what we are before God alone. You know, we're in the Instagram world. 
where everything is filtered for public consumption. And we put on pretty good religious facade, frankly. And we clean up good for church. Don't we clean up good for church? And we carry our Bibles and we sing our hymns and we nod our heads and we say our amens. But don't you think, don't you have the sneaking suspicion that something of the power and dynamic and And enabling of that first century church is woefully lacking in what we see today among God's people. Could it be? Because we've neglected the fountain of it. See, everybody wants the product and nobody wants the process. Everybody wants the blessings of God. But what about the people who seek the blesser? Now, I'll let you know a little secret, church. You get real close to God and God will give you everything else you need. Where does that begin? It begins in the secret place. So with that in mind, let's walk through these first couple of verses, and let me give you some principles. Look at verse number 5. When thou prayest, thou should not be as the hypocrites are. And by the way, when we read that, don't we almost even read it with disdain like the hypocrites? Could it be that while we're thinking about the hypocrites, we are the hypocrites? I'll tell you who the hypocrites are. The hypocrites are other people. And other people's sins. You know, I'm in different churches every week in my life, and I'm in many times in churches where I don't know anybody. <clears throat> and I'll come into a meeting, and somebody will say to me, Well, preacher, we really need a revival here. We really need a revival, and we're praying that God will use this meeting, and we want you to really preach the Bible because we really need a revival. I'm going to give you the translation of what they just said, all right? Preacher, preach really hard because everybody else in this room really needs to get right with God. And, I mean, people even listen to sermons that way. It's like, I hope she's paying attention because she really needs this today. Or, boy, I wish he had been here today. What's the words of that old spiritual? Not my brother, not my sister, but it's it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So, look, he's looking these disciples in the face, and he's saying to them, don't you be a bunch of hypocrites. Stop thinking about the other hypocrites just a minute. Don't you be a hypocrite. And then he says of these hypocrites, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So let me give you the first principle about the secret place. Would you write this down somewhere in the margin of your Bible, someplace that you'll remember? Number one, I want you to see that Jesus emphasized not public prayer but private prayer. Now that's very important. Somebody said, preacher, don't you believe in public prayer? Well, I did it a moment ago, didn't I? Of course I believe in public prayer. Do you think there ought to be collective prayer, corporate prayer? Do you think it's good to have prayer meetings where we all get together? Yes or no, church? Of course it is. What kind of church would this be if your pastor came in, conducted every meeting, and never prayed? Can you imagine having such a church? Somebody said, well, we wouldn't go to a church like that. No, we believe in public prayer, and yet, oh, I love this. Jesus backs up one step from that, and he says, let me talk to you about the private prayer. Let me talk to you not about the synagogues and not about the streets. Let me talk to you about the secret place. Why would that be? I'll tell you why. Because your public praying ought to grow out of your private praying. For example, we came to a worship service today. Now, whether it's a worship service or not, that's really between you and God. It's not a worship service because we call it a worship service. It's not a worship service because we preach on worship. It's not a worship service because even the person next to you is worshiping. See, worship is not a group sport. Did you understand that? Worship is the individual heart attitude towards God. So, you could come in here, you could sit in all three meetings today and not worship God. If I go stand in a garage, does that make me a car, yes or no? No. Doesn't change who I am, doesn't change my nature. So you can sit in church all day today, and you cannot worship. Somebody say, well, what's the best way to be sure you worship when you come to church? I'll let you in a little secret. Bring your worship with you when you come to church. Don't wait to get to church to worship God. Worship should not begin at the church house. It should begin at your house. So watch. When you worship God privately in secret, Then when you get in the public place, the worship is not forced. The worship is not given with the idea that other people are listening or other people are watching or other people are approving of this. No, no, look, it is not a manward view of prayer. It is a Godward view of prayer. In fact, I'm going to tell you what I've learned for me because I offer public prayers. Many, many times I offer public prayers. When I am most right with God, and I'm not always right with God, 
And don't look at me so pious. You're not always right with God either. When I am most right with God, when I pray in public, I am not conscious that other people are listening to me pray. I mean by that, when I'm close to the Lord like I ought to be, really what old Vance Havner used to call in tune with heaven. When I'm in tune with heaven, I'm not thinking about you. I'm not worried about if I'm saying the right words for you. I don't really care about what you think about my prayer. Because I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to God. And yet, here's what we've done. We've started on the outside and tried to work in. Jesus said, no, no, let's start on the inside and work our way out. Not the public prayers, but the private prayers. Do something. Mark this in your Bible. In verse 5, mark, mark these locations. He uses three illustrations. He said, they like to pray standing in the synagogue. Where's the synagogue? That's the religious setting. We like to pray in the synagogues, don't we? The religious settings. The synagogue, did you know the synagogue was the model for the New Testament church assembly? Not the temple. The temple was a place of sacrifice and worship. We don't make sacrifices here, and that's not, that's not the thing. Uh, even people say they come to worship God. Friend, you can worship anywhere because this is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. The New Testament assembly was modeled on the synagogue. The synagogue was a place where they studied the Old Testament scriptures. It was a place of instruction, and we all need that. But it was an honor. Did you know it was an honor to get called on to pray in the synagogue? Because you get to come to the front and stand in front of all those people and offer your prayer to God. And Jesus said, they love that. They just love it. They want to be seen and heard of men. And then mark this location, the streets. Now, what's the street corner about? Well, there were times of prayer, 9 o'clock in the morning, noon, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon were set times of prayer for the Jews. And they made a big spectacle out of it. So it was like they want to call everybody's attention. Hey, 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 everybody look at me now. Pay close attention. I'm getting ready to talk to God. How pompous we can get, how full of ourselves. By the way, when we're full of us, it's evidence we're not full of him. And when I'm thinking more about me and more about you than I am about God, something is woefully wrong. And here's what Jesus does. Isn't this interesting? He moves from verse 5, the synagogues and the streets, look at verse 6, to the closet. Somebody said, does that literally mean i got to go in my closet to pray? This might interest you. Did you know that the word Jesus uses here for closet, this is fascinating, was a word that was commonly used in Jesus' day. The people that were listening to him would have understood this word. It was the word that was used for the storeroom of the house where all of the supplies and the treasures were kept. It was, it was like the storage room. That was literally the word that he was using. Think of this just a minute. Jesus said, if you'll get in the quiet place, if you'll get in the place alone, if you'll get in the place where it is in secret, if you'll get in that storeroom, oh, this is glorious, you will find all the supplies and all the treasures that God Almighty has for you. Everything you need, God said, I got that stocked up for you. You'll find it in the secret place. So what do we learn? First, that Christ's emphasis is not on public prayer. It's on private prayer. Here's a second little thing that I'm learning, that Christ's emphasis is not first on what we say, but on what God sees. Please hear what I just said. The emphasis is not on what we say, it's on what God sees. See, here's what we want to do. We want to jump straight to verse number 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. We want to jump straight to the form and the function of prayer. Jesus did not start there. Look, please, at verse 6. Thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which, what's that word, church? Seeth. Don't you think it would have made more sense for him to say the Father which hears in secret? He does not say the Father which hears. Does the Father hear? You better believe he hears. His ear is open to our prayer. Praise God for that. Could I remind you, though, that it's not just his ear that's open. His eye is open, too. And that the emphasis here is not on you saying the right words. Look, you can't impress God with your words. So somebody said, well, we, we, we really got the right prayer because this guy really knows how to pray. Well, he might know how to speak, but he may not know how to pray. Because true prayer, ask the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, is not always even articulated in perfect words. Sometimes it's just the groan of the heart before God. Oh, Lord. 
A young man came to me one night at the end of a meeting. He was really broken. And he said, preacher, he said, God got a hold of me tonight. He said, the Holy Spirit brought conviction to me. He was a Christian. And he said, I knew I had to get some things right with God. And he said, in the invitation, I came forward and I knelt to pray. And he said, the strangest thing happened. He said, I'd never had this happen before. He said, I couldn't even talk. He said, I just wept. He said, I tried to pray, preacher. He said, I tried to say the right things. I, I tried to get it out. He said, all I could do was cry. And he said to me, do you think God understood that? And I said, understood it? He liked it. You know why that is? Because the truest prayer is not you just saying all the right things or following some formula or, or getting it all right in prayer. That's not it. It is bearing your soul before the God who already knows. That's what prayer is. And the emphasis here is on the God who sees. And isn't, isn't it funny? Isn't it funny that sometimes we really want God to see? Like when we're in trouble, don't you want God's eye on you, yes or no? Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, look on me now. But when we're not exactly where we ought to be with God, we don't really want God to see. We're Adam and Eve. That's who we are. I tell you what, i got to find me a tree somewhere to hide behind. Making fig leaf aprons, I mean, it'd be comical if it wasn't so tragic. Like we think we can actually hide from the all-seeing eye of Almighty God. Proverbs says his eyes run to and fro throughout all the earth, beholding the evil and the good. Let me tell you something sobering and joyful at the same time, church. God has his eye on you today. The Lord is looking at you. I wish I had time to walk you through the Psalms. Study through the Psalms all the places where he talks about the secret sins and the secret faults, and God sees the secret things. And Deuteronomy says the secret things belong to God. Do you know why some people don't want to pray? I'm going to tell you why they don't want to pray. Because when you really get to prayer, you've got to stop being what you say you are, and you've got to stop being what others think you are, and you've got to be what God knows you to be. Like words don't matter in the secret place. Like the religious, the religious robing has to all just be torn away, and God sees us with nothing but our naked soul before Almighty God. What's he doing? He's bringing us to himself. I'm going to tell you what we do with our Christianity. We hide in public. That's what we do. Did you know even your prayers can be you hiding from God? You ever hear the expression, hiding in plain sight? Have you ever heard that expression before, hiding in plain sight? Do you know sometimes when we think we're most spiritual, when we're praying, we're actually the most deceptive because that's when we're trying to manage God and manage our appearance and manage what we think and all that kind of thing. That's not prayer. I'm going to tell you what prayer is. Prayer is you coming into the secret place and stripping everything else away and saying, Dear God, you know me and you see me, and I'm just going to agree with you. And everything you say about me, I'm going to say, Lord, you're exactly right about that. In fact, that's the essence of the word confess. We quote that verse, if we confess our sins. And I've, I've even preached it like this. You know, if you really pray, oh, God, forgive me. That's not what that verse means. Confess doesn't mean you have to convince God to forgive you. You really think you've got to convince God to do what Jesus already did on the cross of Calvary. Confess literally means say the same thing. When you say the same thing about yourself and your sin that God says about you and your sin, God says, that's good enough for me. And at that moment, you're forgiven and cleansed. And that only happens when we get real and right with God in secret. You know, when you're comfortable with someone, you can be quiet with them. Have you noticed that? Like Tammy and I, we can drive down the road, and we love to talk and spend a lot of time interacting with one another. But we, can, we travel a lot. We can ride along for 30 minutes. We can ride along for an hour sometimes. And uh, she can be thinking, and I can be thinking, and we're not conversing back and forth. I'm perfectly comfortable with her in that. I'm perfectly secure in that silence. But when I get around somebody that I don't know, I have this thing like i got to talk. You know what I'm saying? i got to say something. i got to fill the silence. You know what I'm talking about. You get nervous. You just start talking, talking, talking. You know what I've learned in prayer? I've learned in prayer that you don't even have to do all the talking. You can be still and just know that he is God. That in secret, you can just enjoy the Lord. Let me ask you, sir, ma'am, young person, when was the last time you just enjoyed the Lord? See, most Christians don't even enjoy prayer. You know why? Because it's just the duty and the drudgery and the discipline of it, and they've never gotten to the delight of meeting with the Father in secret. Let me give you one more. 
What do we learn about the secret place? Well, look at it. In verse 5, the emphasis is on pub, not, on, not on public prayer, but on private prayer. In verse 6, the emphasis is not first on what we say, but on what God sees. And then you come to verse 7 and verse 8. And notice, please, that the emphasis of Jesus is not on the form of prayer, but the faith of prayer. It's not on the form of prayer. It's on faith. Heart, look at it, verse 7. But ye, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. In America, we have religious groups that just repeat and recite prayers, and you don't have to say it the right way. I, my, I, my heart was sick. My heart was sick. Hearing all these people in Arizona uh, just recently talking about how uh, their baptism of their babies wasn't done right, and something wasn't recited right, and now their eternal destinies weren't certain. And I thought, dear Lord in heaven, if my eternal destiny rested on some man saying the right words, I'd be in a mess of trouble. It doesn't rest on that. It rests on who Jesus is. I remember being in Cairo, Egypt years ago on Friday, the Muslim day of prayer, and watching those people. You could hear the call of prayer going out over the loudspeakers. They'd stop in the middle of the street, throw out their prayer rugs and get down on their face and begin their recitations. And I thought to myself, now we want to talk about their vain repetition, but what about our vain repetition? Just going through the motions. Well, they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. Do you see, in verse 5 and 6, he says, look, it shouldn't be praying for recognition. And then in verse 7 and 8, he said, we shouldn't just be praying for repetition. Look at verse 8. Be not ye therefore likened to them, for your Father knoweth. Aren't you glad your Father knows? What does he know, church? Would you like the answer? Yes, all of the above. He knows everything. In fact, when I read the end of this verse this week, what things you have need of before you ask him, my mind went to Isaiah 65, 24, where the Bible says that while they're speaking, he'll answer. And before they ask, he'll, he'll answer. Isn't that just like God? God already knows. So what is the emphasis? Watch. Not on you convincing God, not on you controlling God, not on you scheming and getting God to come around to your way of thinking, but rather you saying, dear Lord, I'm trusting you. I know your way is right, and whatever you choose will be right, and my faith is in God. You remember in the Old Testament, those prophets of Baal? They prayed for half a day. Think on that, half a day. Oh, Baal, hear us. Baal couldn't hear. Baal wasn't real. See, you can pray a long time and not get your prayers answered. How about in the book of Acts? Two hours in Ephesus, they cried out at the top of their voice, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Two hours they did it. Watch, please. There was no true prayer in either one of those. Let me tell you where the true prayer comes in. Not with the length of prayer. Look, please. Prayer has less to do with your mouth and more to do with your heart. It has less to do with the form of your prayer and more to do with the faith of your prayer. Did you know you could actually go through the motions of prayer and not really pray? You could say all the right things, but if there's no faith, if there's no heart in it, what's Jesus doing? Oh, I love this. It's painful, but I love it. He's stripping away all the peripheral things, all the secondary things, and he's getting right down to the heart of the matter. And that is our life in secret. I want to ask you one question. It is this. Are you more comfortable with people in public than you are with Jesus in private? Because until we get to the place where we just enjoy being with the Lord in the secret place, we will never know all that our Father has for us. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.